Leah, a student at Baldwin High School, and I'd like to share with you about the wonderful world of TNR. And with that, I'll be giving a tutorial on how to successfully perform TNR. Before we get into what TNR is and what it involves, it's important to understand the basics of cat population. To start, cats have only recently been introduced into household settings, and in fact, a majority of countries still see cats as predominantly outdoor creatures. That being said, many cats hold primal instincts of survival suited for the outdoors that help them defend their territories and reproduce successfully. In recent years, feral cats have reproduced with one another so much so that overpopulation has been a serious problem. In an effort to stop cat overpopulation, TNR has been a humane and effective way of both ending the problem and the nuisance behaviors that are associated with it. TNR stands for Trap, Neuter, Release, which is the process by which community cats are trapped, neutered, and returned to the exact place where they were found. By using TNR, cats have demonstrated less lingering and aggressive behaviors and instead have proven to live out the rest of their lives both happier and healthier. In comparison to other methods of cat population control, such as catch and kill, TNR focuses on ensuring cats are placed back into their exact natural habitats. Part of the reason why methods like catch and kill are so ineffective is because of a particular phenomena called the vacuum effect. When cats are removed or euthanized, the area in which they inhabited acts as a sort of vacuum that pulls in other cats from nearby colonies. With this, the problem of overpopulation continues because these neighboring cats are not spayed or neutered. TNR ensures that cats are placed back into their rightful location, which will reduce problems of cat overpopulation by inhibiting the vacuum effect from occurring. With all this information in mind, let's move on to our TNR tutorial. So here's our trap, and just looking at it, we have a front door, a back door, um, and here I'm going closer to the handle. Right below the handle, you can see this steel plate. This is the handle plate to protect your hands when you're carrying the cat. Then here's the front door. It has these two rings that can go up and down to open the cage, like I've demonstrated. Then you have these two bars at the front of the cage, and I'm just lifting them to form this T formation. And so that's gonna keep the front door up and activate the trip plate that we'll see later. Moving to the back of the cage, we have the back door. Now the back door can move up and down, like I'm going to demonstrate here. And as you can see, the trip plate is activated with that T shape that we made with the front door. So once the cat steps on it, the front door will close. And that's it. The first step to a successful TNR run is locating an area with a possible population of cats. It's important to note that cats with an ear tip, or light cut on the ear, are already fixed and should not be trapped. Furthermore, cats with collars and or tags may be pets, and it is important to contact the owner instead of trapping when this occurs. The next step in TNR is setting up a feeding schedule for the cats. By creating a schedule for mealtime, the cats will return to the feeding area at the same time every day to get fed. Simple cat foods like tuna or a can of sardines are just enough to satisfy a hungry roaming cat in the neighborhood. About a day before trapping, you may want to withdraw from the scheduled feeding. This will make trapping much more easier, as the cats will be hungrier and hence enter the traps to eat food. In addition to this, a couple of days before trapping, it is best to place the food in the traps with a trip plate unactivated in order to get the cats used to entering the traps. As an example, I have located several cats in my neighborhood and have established a feeding schedule for them. On the day of trapping, I set up my traps with the front door open and trip plate activated. I also placed a trail of food that leads towards the can of food in my trap. I chose to use a mixture of sardines and tuna as bait for the cats. Before trapping, I stood a distance away from the bait so as to not be detected by the cats. And from here, I watched as the cats entered, ate the food, and stepped on the trip plate. I quickly hurried over and placed a towel over the trap to lessen the stress the cats faced, and I gave the cats some time to calm down. With both cats, I made sure to place them in a quiet area until I was able to bring them into the Humane Society Veterinary Clinic to be fixed. Before arriving at the clinic, it's important to remember that an appointment must be made with a community cat coordinator in order to bring the cats in. This will lessen the influx of people that enter the clinic and ease the process by which your cats can be taken care of. After this, the cats are brought into the vet clinic, where they will first be ear-tipped and microchipped to identify that they have already been fixed. 
Next, the cats will either be spayed or neutered. Neutering is the process by which an incision is made into the scrotal sac of the cat and the testicles are removed. Spaying happens to female cats, where an incision is made in the abdomen right below the belly button. From here, both ovaries and the uterus are removed. Cats are always placed under anesthesia before being spayed or neutered to ensure no discomfort or pain to the cat. By removing the reproductive organs in cats, not only are they unable to repopulate, but they also exhibit less aggressive behaviors that come in part due to reproductive hormones. After surgery, cats can receive vaccinations prior to their return to field. If this is something you want for your cat, it's important to indicate this on the preliminary paperwork that is done when you first bring your cats in. Again, always make sure to schedule an appointment before bringing the cats in, as things at the clinic are usually very busy. In fact, just recently the Humane Society surpassed its goal of successfully spaying and neutering 7,000 cats. Instead, 8,080 kitties are now living their best lives thanks to the TNR program. Finally, the cats are returned to the exact location they were found in after they have recovered from surgery. From here, the cats live freely in the community without overpopulating and exhibiting nuisance behaviors. With that, our TNR tutorial is summed up, and I wish you a lucky trapping! As a part of this TNR tutorial, I think it's important to address some frequently asked questions that arise in our community. And so the first question is, why not trap and kill cats? As previously discussed, trap and kill is a method of cat population control that is both inhumane and ineffective. In a case study held on Little Barrier Island in New Zealand, it was determined that in the year of 1980, all cats on the island were eradicated. This was due in part to the use of dog predation on cats, the poisoning of cats, the use of cage traps, and even the use of leg hole traps. The island, only 11 square miles, had an estimated 150 cats that inhabited the area, and it was planned that both the cat and rat populations were to be eradicated to save the local bird species. It was found that the total cost of killing all cats and rats on the island was around $6,700 to $112,000. Taking the same situation and applying it to Maui, the cost to eradicate both cats and rats would be around $4 million to $81 million when taking into account the square footage of our island. Not only is chop and kill an expensive process, but it is also mentally taxing on the people who have to perform such tasks. It has been proven that animal care workers who have participated in the killing of healthy animals have shown signs of PTSD or trauma. Instead of chopping and killing cats, TNR should be implemented. With TNR, there is an affordable cost to control cat population because the process is primarily run by volunteers, colony care providers, and community supporters. Furthermore, the humane trapping of cats also includes vaccination, microchipping, and ear tipping to identify the decrease in cat population. The next question that is often asked is, why not put all cats in a sanctuary? There's been speculation that putting cats in a sanctuary would solve the problem of cat overpopulation by allowing cats to mate and live their lives in a controlled area. However, the idea of a cat sanctuary is not as beneficial as it seems. In a sanctuary, long-term care is hard to find and overcrowding becomes a major issue that can cause stress and the spread of contagious diseases. Moreover, for feral and socialized cats, sanctuaries can pose a social strain towards the cats by subjecting them to either an abundance of animals or a lack of sufficient one-on-one -on -one time with humans or familiar cats. Additionally, the process of relocating the cats to a cat sanctuary can be quite dangerous to the cats, as they may wander around unknown and harmful territory in hopes of getting back to their homes. Another frequently asked question is, could licensing and leashing be more effective than TNR in controlling the cat population? The idea of licensing and leashing every outdoor cat can be seen as almost impossible due to the nature of feral cats in the community. Already there are laws and regulations that force owners to license their cats in order to prove ownership and adoption. However, not all cats are adoptable or sociable, so to think that all cats should be licensed, leashed, and placed indoors is quite ambitious. With feral cats who have not been readily socialized with people, leashing them could be unfair. Feral cats have lived outdoors for all their lives and so putting them in a brand new environment can be dangerous to both the owner and cat. Keep in mind that sometimes the kittens of feral litters are socialized at an early age to be put into adoption services, but this is perhaps the only way to take in a feral cat safely. Instead of licensing and leashing all cats, TNR can be a more safe and efficient way of controlling cat populations, keeping in mind the welfare of both the cats and people. The next question is, why not issue a feeding ban on cats? The idea of establishing a feeding ban is that the cats will run out of food and simply disperse elsewhere. This will rarely ever happen. 
When cats are cut off from their regular food supply, they will scavenge for new sources of food, which can lead to the spread of harmful disease. Researchers have found that unmanaged feral cats have higher rates of spreading toxoplasmosis, a dangerous disease that can cause fever, headaches, and inflammation, partly due to consuming wild prey. Another problem is that TNR will be difficult to perform as the bait of using food to lure cats into the traps will be banned. Lastly, I think it's important to note the community's strong opinions towards placing feeding bans on cats. Many cat caretakers will go out of their way to ensure that their cats are being fed and not left to starve. Even if it is illegal to feed cats, there will be people that will go against these bans and see to it that these cats are being cared for. A great example of this can be seen with the community's comments to Maui County's proposal on creating a feeding ban for cats. Many people voiced their opinions saying the ban was inhumane, cruel, unethical, and a form of animal cruelty. Another popular question is, won't releasing the cats with TNR cause harm to local wildlife? It is a part of TNR that cats will be released back into their natural habitat, where they will be able to resume normal feeding and living habits. But this does not necessarily mean that the cats are fully accountable for causing all harm to other animals or wildlife. Here on Maui, we have many endangered native species that require safety regulations to keep their population steady. From monk seals to native birds, cats have always been blamed for spreading diseases or overhunting, which could lead to the decrease in these species populations. However, looking closely at the facts, it can be seen that there are many other factors that play into the slow decrease in population for the animals in the endangered species list. For bird predation, it was proven that about 33% of nestlings would survive with both cats and rats. When cats are taken out of the picture, leaving rats as the only predator to the birds, 10% of nestlings would survive. That's an astounding 1 out of 10 nestlings that would survive if cats were eradicated. This goes hand in hand with the fact that 10% of cat prey is birds and a majority of their hunting involves rodents. By keeping cats around, 1 out of every 3 nestlings would survive as cats hunt for the rodents who more readily eat eggs and nestlings of birds. This sort of predation could even slow the rate at which rodents transmit harmful diseases like leptospirosis, salmonella, and Lassa fever. It should also be taken into account that mongoose are perhaps a more deadlier predator to ground nesting birds than cats are. Many articles published on native wildlife explain that mongoose are out of control when it comes to eating eggs and chicks of endangered birds. Even mosquitoes who pass avian malaria and pox can be seen as partly to blame for the disease in native birds. On the other hand, it has been thought that the spread of disease by cats has caused the ever-decreasing population of monk seals on the island. However, the seals themselves face more hardships from human contact and other natural causes as compared to cat causes. For example, hundreds of seals have been either entangled in plastic debris or accidentally caught in fishing gear in the ocean, which has led to the death of many seals. Moreover, there have been several cases of intentional injuries to monk seals caused by gunshots and even blunt force. In fact, since 2017, there have unfortunately been nine deaths on the islands caused by these intentional injuries. Furthermore, the decrease in seal population can be due to natural causes of shark predation, male aggression towards partners, and even lack of diversity in the gene pool. Instead of placing the blame on cats for endangering native wildlife, an understanding of other causes needs to be made. Things like predator-proof fencing should be established in areas where there is native wildlife in order to keep all predatory animals out. As with seals and other endangered marine animals, focus should be placed on regulating human interactions to keep these species as safe as possible. Next question is about the cat-caused spread of toxoplasmosis to humans and seals alike. So going back to disease spread in cats, toxoplasmosis has always been a huge issue when it comes to feral cats and outdoor cats in general. Although cats can carry the toxoplasmosis infection, it is quite rare to contract the parasite from them. To start, cats get contaminated with the infection by eating birds, rodents, or raw meat with the Toxoplasma gondii parasite present. From here, the cats can develop immunity in just as little as 1-3 to three weeks. When this happens, the parasite is considered dormant and the cat can no longer shed infective eggs. It is estimated that around 15-40% to 40 of cats have been exposed to toxoplasmosis, but less than 1% of these cats shed infective oocytes in their stool. Moreover, since 2001, there have been about 11 known deaths caused by toxoplasmosis, and less than 5% of these cases involve cats shedding infective toxoplasma eggs. All things being said, it is important to recognize the risks of toxoplasmosis and understand the ways in which it can be prevented. 
humans will more than likely contract the disease from eating contaminated foods, undercooked meat, or drinking contaminated water, more often than contracting the disease from cats. With this, people can spread the disease from mother to child during pregnancy, through infective organ transplants, or even blood transfusions. To prevent transmitting toxoplasmosis, it is recommended that foods are cooked well and prepared properly to ensure that sanitary needs are met. As for dealing with cats, it is well advised to keep indoor cats indoors and handle kitty litters using gloves, as well as being sure to hand wash after handling the litter itself. The last question of our FAQs is, does TNR even work? Many people will deny the fact that TNR is an effective way to combat cat overpopulation. This can be seen as true due in part to several factors. Firstly, TNR relies on community participation to be successful. If people do not readily volunteer to take part in TNR, cat overpopulation will continue to be a major problem. Secondly, there have been instances where cat feeders continue to feed cats but refuse to spay and neuter. When this happens, the cats are given the resources to mate with one another and repopulate easily. Lastly comes into context the idea of cat dumping. Cat dumping happens when cats are relocated to a completely different location than they previously inhabited. Since the start of COVID-19, there has been a spike in cat dumping, which has caused an increase in cat breeding and nuisance behaviors in the community. Due to these factors, TNR can be seen as ineffective, but in reality, the program is quite constructive in minimizing cat populations. With TNR, cat colonies are proven to reduce as the years progress by focusing on fertility control by spaying and neutering. Furthermore, the use of TNR in shelter settings has caused adoption rates to increase by bringing in more adoption candidates. Although not all cats are adoptable, TNR provides a community with many new sources of sociable cats, and what's even better is that these cats are already fixed before making their way into their forever homes. With this, euthanasia rates have drastically decreased as well in shelter settings because cats are either released back into their natural environments or given up for adoption. Additionally, the concept of targeted TNR trapping has already been successful in lessening cat colony numbers. With targeted trapping, every cat in a specific area is aimed to be caught, and from there the trapping process is expanded to neighboring colonies. With this, each colony is made sure to be completely trapped and fixed before moving on to the next one. TNR is not only helpful in managing community cat population size, but it can also stop the spread of diseases by providing vaccinations along with sterilizations. These services of vaccinations and spay and neuter can provide community cats with a better chance at living a healthier life outdoors. As for nuisance complaints, TNR has managed to lessen such wild activity in cats. This is due in part to removing the reproductive organs in cats that create hormones that can cause yowling, roaming, fighting, and spraying. In all, it can be seen that TNR is, in fact, quite effective. Now that you've gotten a better sense of TNR and its importance in responsibly caring for our outdoor feline friends, it's time to take action. Whether this be by spreading the word about TNR or actually participating in it yourself, Every little step counts towards ensuring our cats receive some much needed preventative medical care. I of course encourage everyone to take part in the Maui Humane Society's TNR program in order to see that positive change with our animals here on our island. With already such an uptick in interest to the TNR program, every Monday at the Humane Society, spay and neuter clinics get larger and larger. It only goes to show the importance of such a program on the lives of both the people and the cats in our community. So go out there and have a happy trapping.